Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth lesson in our series, Waves in the Real World. In the previous lesson, you learned about how the Doppler effect is applied in the fields of sport, medicine and astronomy. In this lesson, you will learn about how the Doppler effect is used to explain the creation of shock waves formed by jet aircraft and in thunderstorms. You will also learn about the waves formed during earthquakes. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how the Doppler effect applies to the movement of jet aircraft, interpret the speed of aircraft in terms of the Doppler effect, explain how shock waves are generated in thunderstorms, and derive an expression for the angle of a shock wave. In the fourth lesson of the series, you learned about the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect tells us that when a wave source is moving, the waves tend to bunch up in front of the source and spread out behind the source. The wavelength of the waves in front of the source is therefore shortened, while the wavelength of the waves behind the source is lengthened. This brings us to an interesting question. What would happen if the source moved faster than the waves? We will investigate this question by looking at the movement of jet aircrafts, which are able to travel faster than the speed of sound. We will begin with looking at a jet that is traveling through the air with a velocity that is lower than the speed of the sound waves coming from its engine. We say that the jet is traveling with a subsonic speed. This picture represents the wave fronts of the sound waves that are coming from the engine. If the jet increases its speed so that it travels at the same speed as the speed of sound, the jet will actually catch up with the sound waves that come from its engine. The pattern of the wave fronts will change so that the waves pile up at the front of the jet. The area where the wave fronts pile up is called a sound barrier. The overlapping waves cause a lot of disruption of the air that is traveling over the wings of the jet, making it very difficult for the pilot to control the aircraft. People in the aircraft industry describe the speed of an aircraft using a term called the Mach number. This number is the ratio of the speed of the jet to the speed of sound. For the motion that we have just been looking at, the speed of the jet is equal to the speed of sound. So the Mach number for a jet that is traveling at the speed of sound is Mach 1. Let's now look at a situation where the jet increases its speed even further so that it is flying faster than the speed of sound. At the point where its speed becomes faster than the speed of sound, we say that the jet has broken the sound barrier. Interestingly, it is actually possible to see the moment when a jet aircraft breaks the sound barrier. Because the jet is now flying ahead of its sound waves, it's free to fly in clear, undisturbed air because there are no sound waves in front of it. The wave fronts of the sound waves will superimpose with each other, adding together to produce a three-dimensional shock wave, which has a cone shape. When we draw this on a flat page, it looks like a V. When this shock wave reaches somebody standing on the ground, it causes a very loud sound called a sonic boom. When a jet flies faster than the speed of sound, its speed is described as being supersonic. Because the jet's velocity is greater than the speed of sound, its Mach number would then be greater than 1. We can actually see a shock wave when we look at a speedboat traveling through water. When the boat is moving faster than the water waves that it is causing, the superposition of the waves behind it form a shock wave. When this is formed in water, it is usually called a bow wave. Those of you who live in areas where there are a lot of thunderstorms will also know what a shock wave sounds like. It's the loud thunderclap that you hear after a flash of lightning. Let's take a look at what causes this thunderclap. During a storm, small ice crystals inside the clouds rub against each other. 
This friction causes the top of the clouds to become positively charged and the bottom to become negatively charged. At the same time, objects on the ground become positively charged because the negative charges in the clouds are attracting the positive charges on the Earth and repelling the negative charges deeper into the Earth. Eventually, the electric field between the clouds and the Earth becomes so strong that the charge jumps to the ground or to a nearby cloud in the form of lightning. The lightning heats the air around it, causing the air to expand very quickly, creating a region of low pressure. Surrounding air moves towards the area of low pressure, causing the air to be compressed. The rapid expansion and contraction of air generates areas of compression and rarefaction, in other words, sound waves. Because the movement of the lightning towards the Earth is quicker than the speed of sound, the sound waves given off by the rapidly expanding and contracting air form a shock wave. When this shock wave reaches us, we hear a loud crack. Because sound travels slower than light, we always hear the thunderclap after we see the lightning. Another type of wave we find in the real world are the head waves or seismic waves produced during earthquakes. Although they are often called shock waves, they are very rarely of the type of waves that we have just described. However, they are very dangerous. When earthquakes happen in populated areas, they can cause a large amount of destruction, depending on the size of the earthquake. Now, let's go into the field to find out more about earthquakes. We're here at CSIR to meet with some postgrad students who are going to tell us more about earthquakes. Um, could you tell me what would cause an earthquake? Okay, uh, basically earthquake is caused by a uh, movement of plate tectonics. And plate te tectonics is the movement of uh, lithospheric plates uh, 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 in the earth. Um, and uh, the movement is due to the cooling and heating of the rock and that result to convection and uh, that causes a place to move and uh, an earthquake can occur, yes. And could you tell us more about the shock waves that are formed during an earthquake? Um, shock waves do occur during earthquakes but they're actually quite rare and uh, I'll tell you about the, the common waves that are generated during an earthquake. Now there are um, two classes of these waves generated, uh, the body waves and the surface waves. Now body waves, there are two types of, of body waves. There's the P waves, uh, primary waves, and the S waves, the secondary waves. Now the primary waves are faster and they get recorded earlier than the secondary waves. And um, in rock, they move at a velocity of about 6 to 13 kilometers per second. Now, if, you, if you're looking into the material, as the wave propagates, there's contraction and dilation of the material. So the, actually, the, the particle movement is, you know, um, is parallel to the direction of motion. Now, the secondary waves, those ones are recorded uh, uh, later on and they propagated a velocity of about 3.5 to 7.5 kilometers per second. Now, um, the particle motion in this case is perpendicular to the direction of, of propagation of the waves. The other type of, of uh, waves are the surface waves. Now, there are two types of those, as the love wave and the rally waves. Now, these are generated at a surface. For uh, one surface will be the, uh, the surface between the rock and the air, the earth surface. Now, actually, these are the most, uh, the ones which cause the most damage, the rally waves. How are waves used to pinpoint the location of an earthquake? Okay, there are quite a number of uh, earthquake location methods. I'll mention three, the triangulation method, the relative method, and the double difference method. The triangulation method is the one I'll go into, and uh, it's quite the oldest of the three that I mentioned. Basically, if you have three receiver stations for, uh, to, uh, to, to, to record uh, a seismogram from an earthquake, you 
from the PNS waves that my colleague just mentioned, you use the arrival times from the PNS waves, the, the difference between the arrival times from the PNS waves to calculate the horizontal distance to the event, and then you use this distance from each receiver station to the event, you use the distance between them as a radius that will, for the circle that you would draw around uh, each station. So the point at which uh, each station, the circle you drew around each station meets, that is the point where the earthquake happened. And this point is the is a epicenter, which is the point directly above the focus of the earthquake in the Earth's surface. And this gives you the location of the earthquake. It's just as simple as that. Wasn't that interesting? Now for your task for today, I want you to analyze the shock wave formed by a jet flying at supersonic speeds. You are going to use the velocity of the jet and the speed of the sound waves to work out the angle of the shock wave. To do this, we will draw a diagram that shows the shock wave, a wave front of sound produced by the jet, the velocity of the jet, and the velocity of sound. To start, I have shown the starting position of the jet as a dot. The jet is a source of sound waves which move outwards from this point. So at this time, where do you think the jet will be? Well, since the jet moves faster than the speed of sound, the jet will be at a point outside of the circle at this time. This point is the tip of the V of the shock wave. Now, to find the angle of the shock wave, we need to draw in the velocity vector, Vj, to represent the velocity of the jet, and the velocity of the sound wave, Vs, where it meets the V of the shock wave. From geometry, we know that the angle between a radius and the tangent to a circle is 90 degrees. So the triangle containing the velocity vectors for the jet and the sound is a right angle triangle. Now, you should be able to tackle the task. Can you work out from this diagram how to use trigonometry to write an expression for the angle theta in terms of the velocity of the jet, given here as Vj, and the speed of sound, given here as Vs? Thank you for joining me today. This brings us to the end of our series of lessons on waves in the real world. I hope that you have enjoyed the series and that you now have more of an appreciation for how our scientific knowledge helps us to understand the real world that we live in. Yeah.